Have you ever been scared to ask a question out loud? Maybe you fear that someone will judge you if you do. Perhaps you're nervous that you may not like the answer you get. Or maybe you would feel like less than a good Christian if you are honest about your doubts. In this series, we're tackling some of the questions we might be afraid to ask but want answers to. Does science contradict God or is there evidence for a creator? Can I really trust a book that's 2,000 years old? If God is real, why is there so much suffering? How could a loving God send people to hell? Together, we'll explore why asking good questions is not merely okay, but essential to our faith, and we'll discover some satisfying answers along the way. This is tough stuff, and we believe God's shoulders are big enough to handle it. How are you guys doing tonight? Good. Terrific. Well, this is my 10th session in 72 hours, I think. I've been piloting all over the Reading area to different churches and at Shasta Bible College, having a great time with a bunch of other speakers through the Alpha and Omega Conference, talking about Alpha and Omega. Omega. Jesus is the beginning and the end. And it's so fun hanging out with these guys who are prophecy experts and experts on the book of Revelation because I just come right up to them and say, look, I'm, I'm very much a beginnings guy. I know nothing about Revelation, although you know, I, I've studied it before and everything, but it's definitely not my forte. All I know is it's going to happen, and we're probably getting ready for some stuff that's going to happen too. So it's very interesting to, to study and to know from Scripture that Christ is both the beginning and the end, and all things go through him. So let's start out with a, with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being our creator and for being in tune with each one of us and our individual needs. Lord, I pray that your message would go out tonight and, and be professed boldly and change hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so my hope tonight is really only one thing. I want to present information and evidence that will help everyone here tonight understand that the creator and the designer of the universe, who has quite obviously made everything, is connected to the Elohim of the Bible. That's what God calls himself in Genesis chapter 1. So it's one thing just to, to come at this topic from an intelligent design standpoint and say, well, look at this, the universe is created and all these animals seem intricately designed. But if we don't segue from there, from design and creation, over to the God of the Bible, we really haven't accomplished much because it's the God of the Bible who saves and it's the God of the Bible who can deliver. And Jesus has a very special place in creation. Colossians says that all things were created by him and through him. John 1 says the same thing. Christ was there present at creation, creating with the Father. So creation is a very a near and dear topic to Christ himself. And in fact, Jesus, when he referred back to the history of the Old Testament, uh, and, and, and including Genesis, which he referenced it 42 different times, Jonah and the fish and Sodom and Gomorrah and creation. He always referred to it in a literal historical sense. So we have good credibility from our Savior that we can trust the beginning chapters of the Bible. Okay, so let's just do a quick review about our, our ministry. We do have some books out for sale tonight. Any book is just $10, or if you're, you're a student of, of any affiliation, it's completely free. And all of the materials I'm about to show you guys are also completely free. They're downloadable from our website. You can download the books as PDFs, and the videos are available on your smartphone or on YouTube. And uh, our message here is to try We really want to get this information out because... Um, Kids and students, at least if you just look in California, they receive about 50 classroom hours of evolutionary teaching before graduating high school, and it sums up over three or four grades where it's intensively taught, totaling about 250 pages of evolution teaching. And typically what we find, and this is no judgment on anybody, it's just a, a scientific review, typically we find that, that Christian parents are not countering that with much and certainly not enough of the creation teaching because the kids are going to school, they're taught this evidence from a historical evidential background, but they're not typically given enough information on creation to, to hold fast. So a lot of kids nowadays when they graduate a high school are not necessarily believing in the God, the creator of the Bible. They're believing in a deluded version of God where God just spun everything up and, and allowed creation or, or allowed evolution to really put biology on, on, on planet today. But the Bible has a much, much different story where God created a, it's called a special creation where he breathed it into existence and put it here uh, only recently. 
So the four uh, chapters of our division is, first of all, we strengthen Christian schools. There's six or seven schools in the Northern California region that we're in all the time. We do conferences there and teaching there, and Dave will do a couple-day seminars uh, there. We give local church presentations. We were doing about 50 a year before COVID hit. Uh, but I think one of our largest regional uh, reaches is the G1 conference. We just did that at, at William Jessup University in participation with speakers from Answers in Genesis, the Institute for Creation Research, and CMI. Had about a dozen speakers, and we filmed the whole thing, broadcast it uh, on Facebook and on YouTube, and we're up over 30,000 views now, which is great because we typically sell out our local conference with just a, you know, three, four, five hundred people, and then that's limited to how many people we can reach. But going online now, we've had a much broader reach, which has been great. But I think by far our, our broadest broadcast uh, reach is through YouTube and Facebook. We have about 111,000 YouTube subscribers and about 10 million views on YouTube. And I think we're one of the top three or five uh, creation content providers on YouTube, which has been fun to be able to do that. And we have a pretty big uh, Facebook follower as well. One of the things that's near and dear to my heart and Dave, uh, who's here doing the students uh, uh, today, is the K-8 Student Zone. We're preparing 72 different video lessons that you can access through the zone. So you just go to our website, just Genesis Apologetics, click on the zone, and it's for K-8 to students. And Dave breaks down the lessons. I think it's K-2 to and 3-5 to five and 6-8. to eight. So we have a whole library of video lessons there that you can uh, view with your, your uh, students or your grandkids or whatever the case might be. Um, if you have students that are between 5th and 10th grade, you can go to our, pro our program called debunkevolution.com. It's a series of six different videos that track uh, junior high and high school level biology and the evolution teaching that kids get today, and it addresses it from a biblical and scientific standpoint. And then for high schoolers that are about 11th grade up and higher, you can go to our 7 program where we will get them ready and prepared for going into college. So that's how we break up our training. And we have our answers book. This is one of my favorite because we get thousands and thousands of questions every year, and a lot of them seem to be the same. So we took the top 50 questions we always get asked about Genesis creation and the flood and developed a really crisp, clear answers for those top 50 questions. And I think for about 10 of the 50, we have videos that people can watch there as well. And on our YouTube channel, here's our top four most watched videos. Uh, we currently have the leading video about Noah's flood and the mechanics about it. It's really not my doing. We just spent a year uh, interviewing some of the top flood geologists in the world. Uh, and distilled down a very, very clear process of what happened in the flood. And it's actually quite obvious from a geological and a geophysical standpoint that there was a worldwide flood. And this team of six PhDs in the 1990s formed a theory called catastrophic plate tectonics, and they nailed it. They absolutely have figured out what happened on Earth about four and a half thousand years ago when the worldwide flood hit. And then the other videos we have here that are some of our, our most watched are, are the miracles that happen at the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. There are five really core, clear evidences that substantiate the crucifixion and the resurrection. And the last two about are about dinosaurs, and we'll be, be touching that topic a little bit here tonight. If you have your, your phones and you've got a, a, a Google Android phone or an I, iTunes uh, phone, you can just uh, download our Genesis Apologetics mobile app. We have about 100,000 people that have downloaded that, and that's free, and all the videos are available there. Uh, we've just done two of our feature movies uh, this year. One of them is called Genesis Impact. That features a young uh, creationist college student who dialogues with a museum docent from a natural history museum for about 45 minutes. It's kind of a stage dialogue, uh, if you will, where she takes apart the top 10 leading evidences that are shown in natural history museums. So when you go to the Smithsonian or San Francisco or LA and you go through a natural history museum, you can pick out the top 10 evolutionary icons and this gal has a dialogue with a museum docent and about all 10. So watch that movie before you go to a natural history museum next. 
And then our next movie that we just came out with on Good Friday, actually, is called Foundations Movie. Really well done. I certainly like it. It's about 23 minutes only. It's a short story, and it shows how your belief about origins can play out and impact literally your whole life. What you believe about where we came from, how this planet was made, things like that can really have a, it can play out in different ways. So we take three different scenarios with this young man's life and act out his whole life based upon his different belief systems. And uh, so with that intro, let's go into something that Scripture has to say about this whole creation uh, evolution topic. So this is kind of an, an introduction from Scripture. And what does God have to say about this idea that we, that we evolve? So I'm just going to go ahead and read this. It's out, out of Romans chapter 1, and it says this, For the, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to become wise, they become fools." And change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So this is what creation is called the, the Romans road. So we can see here if people deny God, they're going to start attributing and worshiping nature. And this is exactly what we see when we go to the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. This is the four-footed creature that people believe, the evolutionists believe, we came from about 145 million years ago. As the, the story goes, something like this creature, this one they call Shrewdinger, uh, somehow crawled in about a three-foot hole during the asteroid extinction event about 65 million years ago, they say. Crawled into a hole and, and somehow survived the extinction of the dinosaurs uh, 65 million years ago and then gradually you know, started walking upright and turned into ape-like creatures and then chimps and then went all the way up to Arty and a creature like Lucy or Australopithecines and Homo habilis and then Homo erectus and then Homo sapiens. That's where the story starts. And when you go see this little creature in Washington, D.C. at the Natural History Museum, they've set it up in kind of a throne room. So you walk into this area. It's got three big pillars there. And there's a, a, a sign on the, set, uh, on the side that says, come meet one of your oldest relatives. And on the altar in the middle of this little shrine that they've created, we find this little golden creature as presented as our ancestor. So this is the evolutionary idea of where humans uh, came from. So the biblical standpoint is, is real simple. Just thousands of years ago, Adam was breathed into existence by God. God breathed the soul and the flesh into his nose, making him a living being. And he was, he was created in the image of God, not in the image of apes. And then God drew Eve from his side. We actually have the genealogies that go straight back to Adam just about 6,000 years ago. So that's the biblical standpoint, which is obviously unreconcilable from the idea that we evolved from a little rat about 145 million years ago. Quite, quite different. So that's really the, the big picture that we're, we're dealing with here. But I want to start by just give, I want to actually go through the rest of my talk tonight presenting what I think are 10 very clear lines of evidence that we came from a designer, the, the designer, uh, the creator of the Bible. The first is that we have a very finely tuned universe. Here's a scripture that says, For the, thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, there is no other. So there are a lot of different evidences that we could go through tonight, but if you just, it gets really geeky and really scientific really quick, but when you start looking at some of the features about our universe and our planet, you look at things like, well, the ratio of electrons to proton mass has to be exactly like it is. The electromagnetic and gravitational forces are perfect for life on Earth. Our sun's the right color. The list could just go on and on and on, but even things like the, the gravity that we have, the tilt of 
the earth, it produces seasons. There's a whole lot of things that people, Romans 1 says it's obvious that we're, the people know internally that we're created and that there is a creator, they just suppress it in unrighteousness. So there's all kinds of evidence we could go through tonight that talks about a finely tuned universe, but when you just look at this spinning galaxy, and you look at the gravitational forces and the orbits that are happening, it really is a perfectly put together universe that had to be assembled at once. And Genesis chapter 1 would talk us through the days of creation where God was assembling and putting together the universe. The other thing that I think is quite obvious, when you take Genesis 1 from a literal standpoint, is 10 times in the very first book of the Bible, God uses this term mean, uh, and he uses also this term called bara, which means to create, and then he uses the term mean. And creationists call this a study of baraminology or created kind. So 10 times in Genesis 1, God says things like, well, uh, so the fruit trees of the earth bearing fruit after their kind, but seed in them, and the plants with their kind, and the animals with their kind. God's done something to constrain what we call animal taxons. You've got the dog kind, and the cat kind, and the horse kind, and they typically stay together. If you just take, for example, horses, there's 335 different breeds of horses, but you can take the smallest horse and the biggest horse, and they're interfertile. You look at dogs, for example. Dogs all come from the wolf, but there's 339 dog breeds, and all dog breeds are interfertile. Chickens, you've got 68 breeds of chickens. They can all breed with each other as well. So God's creating this this foot stamp here of different animal kinds. And when you look at Noah's Ark, people, biologists have, have paired this back and look at this very carefully and have determined that you only need about 3,000 kinds of animals on Noah's Ark about 4,400 years ago to get off the ark. The, the flood was a year-long process and populate the earth to the millions of different species that we have today because the animals come from families. And as long as they were interfertile, they could disperse and spread spread around the earth as God had commanded them. So if Genesis is true, we would expect to to see a limited number of kinds with no new kinds emerging because God said he was finished with his creation. That's exactly what we see. We have about only 3,000 different kinds that could go on the ark. Uh, We would also have limited variation within kind, and we would have the reproductive process as the lock and key that would constrain the kinds. You can't breed a monkey with a turtle, and you know, the list goes on and on. God has used a reproductive system to keep kinds as kinds. Now, sometimes we have a little bit of genetic drift where animals used to be the same kind, but they're no longer. You could still take like a tiger and a lion and breed them together. You can make a, li- a liger, but sometimes their offspring are sterile, but they can still interbreed. But uh, it certainly seems like God has set that up as as kinds, and you would only have enough animals that Adam could name in one day, because that's what the Bible says he did. And if Genesis 1 is true, we would expect humans to be the dominant species, because the first thing that God told Adam to do after he created created the animals, and then he created Adam as the last, the capstone of his creation, and said two things to Adam. I want you to name everything, which is exercising authority over everything. And then secondly, I want you to take dominion. You and Eve take charge over the world. And that's exactly what we see humans doing today. We would also expect to find no clear transitions in the fossil record. And we would also expect to see what we, what we see with, with humans. There's, you know, when you look at the idea of race, it's really a concept of culture more so than what the Bible says. All humans are interfertile and we're, because we're the, we're the same kind. We just have adaptations that can vary based upon where we, we live. And I think we're going to skip this one because I don't think we have uh, sound on that one, but hopefully tomorrow we'll, we'll get to, to that one. We have some animated videos I'll, I'll be going through. So next I want to take a look at God as the creator of things great and things really small. God has a discussion with Job in Job chapter 40. And if you look at, has anyone read Job before? Who's read the book of Job before? Okay, great. Basically, you could sum up the book of Job by saying it's 39 chapters of setup and complaining. You know, Job's complaining and his friends are saying, just curse God and die. He's going through a really, really hard time losing everything. God shows up on the scene and rather than consoling Job, 
He tells him to sit down, be quiet, and listen like a man. You can look at the Hebrew. He says some other stuff, too. It was really like God gets in Job's face and says, I want you to sit down and listen to me, and I'm going to tell you some things. And he starts right out of the gate by describing himself as the creator. And he goes right after this, he goes and he says, he says Job, consider behemoth, which I made a- along with you. And then God goes through 14 different characteristics about this creature called behemoth that are not given to any other animal Bible in the Bible. And it's the second largest, longest description of any, bi- of any animal in the Bible. The longest one is Leviathan, which is the next chapter. So God says things like, well, I made behemoth along with you. He eats grass grass like an ox. He has strength in his hips and stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar tree. So right now we're starting to break away from a lot of different animal possibilities because God's saying this creature moves his tail like a cedar. His sinews and and thighs are tightly knit. Well, there's certainly lots of creatures that have sinews and thighs that are, are, are neatly knit. But then we go into the number eight here where God says, oh, by the way, this is the chief, the first in a ranked list of all of my terrestrial land creatures. So what is that creature? It's a sauropod dinosaur. Sauropod dinosaurs come in a lot of different varieties. Uh, they, They can grow up the Argentinosaurus and Dreadnoughtus can grow up to 130 feet long and weigh over 80 tons. They're huge, enormous creatures. And when you look through the description in the book of Job, these 14 characteristics are very telling of a sauropod dinosaur. They're not very good of a hippo or of an elephant. And the the 14th characteristic there, I think, is the one that really boxes us in and says, God says, by the way, this creature can only be approached by its maker, by me. And if you take a sauropod dinosaur that's 130 feet long and it turns around in a circle, it's got a 250-foot kill zone that nobody can get into. It's got a 7,000-pound tail that, that's like swinging a, you know, a, a large SUV around. It's a huge, enormous creature. And here's what its leg looks like. This is a recovered sauropod leg. That's an enormous creature. And here's its footprint. This is a huge, huge animal that God refers to as behemoth. And there's, I've got a video on this. It's about 21 minutes. I would encourage you to go take a look at it. I'm just covering some highlights tonight. But there's a lot of interesting features. Like the Bible says, well, his ribs are like rods of iron. And did you know that sauropod dinosaurs, the only ossified parts or solid bones it has in its body happen to be its ribs. And then God says, well, its bones or its legs are like tubes of bronze and sauropod uh, femurs and tibias are exactly like tubes. They have a hard, like an enamel casing, and they're hollow in the middle because they have to be light. Here's how big its leg would be, just a huge, huge, enormous creature. And when you start really carefully looking at, uh, at, the, at these sauropod dinosaurs, you can zoom in on its neck here and look at these interesting features called chevron bones. They serve as linking points that hide right below the neck there where all the tendons, ligaments, and muscles can connect. Without these special bones that are flexible like ratchets, it would fold its neck over and suffocate, or it folds its neck over and couldn't drink or couldn't eat. There's amazing design that goes into this creature. And a secular paleontologist, Dr. Waddell, has studied this creature extensively and said, you know what, it's like a suspension bridge. You can't have a creature with such a long tail unless you have a a complementary long neck. Without the long neck, you can't have the long tail. If you're going to have a 130-foot animal, it has to have both because engineers refer to it as compressive and tension loading. You have to have both at the same time. So it's amazing design feat when you look at these sauropod dinosaurs. It's vertebrae. Some of them are over four feet long. And the higher you go up the neck, these vertebrae become pneumatic. They're like honeycomb. They're filled with air. So you can see the outside structure here of one of the, uh, the sauropod's vertebrae. And the yellow parts I fly in now are the air-filled parts. So the higher you go up the neck of the sometimes over 100 vertebrae, the more spongy and honeycomb they become so it could even pick its neck up. So it's truly a feat of amazing design. And God says, this creature moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. And sure enough, the paleontologists have determined based upon the linking points of this creature's muscles and tendons, it necessarily had to sway its tail when it walked. 
It, otherwise, it'd be dragging its big tail. It has to pick it up and sway it with each step that it takes. So it's swaying its tail, which was the size of a cedar tree, as it's walking. So now let's look at something really small. Let's focus in on bees. Well, one of the things that's interesting to me about bees is my son and I have been amateur beekeepers now on and off for the last 10 years or so, and it's always just brought me wonder and worship about God to think, my goodness, on day three of creation, God creates all the vegetation, all the plants that require pollination, and then on day five, just a couple days later, he creates the pollinators, the bees and the butterflies. And do you know, if you were to take away all the bees in the world, we'd run out of food in just years, not decades, but just years. In fact, there's some places in China where the bees are getting decimated, and so they have to get up on last to all the different fruit trees with a bowl full of pollen and paintbrushes and manually pollinate every single flower on the tree just to get it fertilized. So God has, has put in the brains of these little bees a self-will to go around and pollinate all of the different vegetation. When you look at the structure that they build inside a hive, a scientists have also determined it's the best storage and strength uh, style that you could have possibly with these hexagonal cells that we have there. It's, they're strong because all the sides are pushing against each other, and it's the way to, to store the maximum amount of pollen and, uh, and honey. And when you take the frames out of the beehives, they do amazing things like this for air ventilation. How did that little tiny bee know how to do this? And in the wintertime, these bees, all the honeybees, will gather around the, the queen and fan their wings. You can walk by a hive in the winter and hear this bzzz, a little faint buzz. They're hovering around the queen bee to keep her at a perfect temperature to sustain life and ventilation. So God has installed in this little tiny bee that has a brain the size of a grass seed all the intelligence and the information and the will to go out and do what it does. Just an amazing creature, and there's no way that mankind could ever duplicate something like this. It would just be impossible. It's too small, and it's too smart, and it even does things like pull nails out of holes. If you were to go up to this bee's uh, hole here where it's hiding its stuff and say, I'm going to jam it up with a nail, this little bee with a grass seed-sized brain is able to grab this nail and yank it out. I wonder if I should stop the video before he's done. Everyone would be ungratified if you did that. But he just keeps coming back with his little legs and pulls and pulls and pulls until it uh, finally comes out. Come on, little guy. you, you got to get this. I'm on a timer, and the pastor's going to kick me out in about 10 minutes. So uh, see, if, there he goes. He's going to do it. He's pulling back. <laughs> you just got to think. Look at that. There he goes. Pull, pulled it out. So, and I've really kind of hovered over the tops of the trees because the most amazing part, just go to Google sometime or, or YouTube, type in waggle dance with a W, waggle dance. This is amazing and you won't even believe it until you research it yourself, but these, these, these bees called scout bees fly away from the hive. They scout out and map out where all the, the flowers are, where the pollen, they fly back into their hive. They, you could put out a hundred different beehives. It smells out its own queen, goes back into that hive of a hundred, it'll find its own queen, and goes in there and lands on the middle of the honeycomb and does a figure eight. And somewhere in that figure eight, he stops and wiggles his tail. Goes around figure eight, stops, wiggles his tail. The rest of the bees get around him in a big circle and watch this waggle dance as he maps out the geography and the location telling the rest of the bees where the flowers are. It's amazing, and, and it's true. So there's a lot of science be, be behind it. He did something with the, the tilt of the, of, of the earth and the, the sun, but there's all kinds of, of science behind this. And when people try to debunk it, they only confirm what's, what's really going on. So inside that little bee mind, he's got all that intelligence to do that. Uh, the next thing I find incredible about the God of creation is he creates without any leftovers. Indeed, the Bible says, for you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my, mother's, my, in my mother's womb. So evolutionary theory predicts that we should have lots of vestigial or leftover structures. And they, they used to say that for, for years. In fact, 
all the way up till 1895, they had accumulated 180 things in our body that they thought were leftovers. They've now dropped that list to zero. If you go to modern text, they have found a purpose for everything. Our tonsils, our, talk, our, our, our coccyx, which is our tailbone, our, all different things that they thought, oh, they're just leftover things like our appendix. Everyone's getting their appendix pulled out. They just published a scientific study showing that we would have worldwide infectious disease levels that would be much higher if everybody had their appendix taken out because it's a storehouse of your healthy flora, your good, your good bacteria. But there's lots of things that we could talk about, about that, but they've basically gone from 180 things they thought were left over from evolution to a list of zero. And here's another thing that I think that shows that God is a God of perfect design. You have to ask yourself questions like this. Well, look at our circulatory system. What evolves first, your heart, blood, or veins? Think about that for a minute. If you didn't have veins, where would the blood flow through? And if you didn't have a heart, what would pump it through the veins? They have to have all three things present at the same time. A friend of mine is a second top leader at a huge hospital system in Northern California. He's a creationist. And I said, hey, tell me, what's the number one proof from you as a medical doctor that God, the God of the Bible, is the designer? And he says, that's easy, blood coagulation. And he says, Dan, go go research it, but there are five separate steps that have to happen in the exact order. When you get a cut, all the signals are spread out through your whole body that tell your body to start clogging up and clotting right then and there. And he says, Dan, if you were to take any one of those five steps out or switch the orders, everything would bleed out and die. And so the God, the designer of the universe, had to put those five separate steps together all at the same time. Just an amazing, amazing thing. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this. This is my favorite topic, so I tend to get sidetracked and want to go over it a, 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 a lot. But I would encourage you to go to YouTube and watch our flood uh, called Noah's Flood and Catastrophic Plate Tectonics. But God is certainly a God of Earth history, and I think what we see around Earth certainly fits a worldwide flood. The short version is this. So in Genesis chapter 9, Chapter 6 to chapter 9, he describes the year-long flood process. Eight people got on a boat with about 3,000 animal kinds with enough food and water storage for a year. Get on there, the water comes up for 150 days, declines for 150 days, and then earth dries out for 70. These are the six guys that came up with a geophysical explanation of what happened during Noah's flood. It's called catastrophic plate tectonics, which basically substantiates that we had a Pangea-like formation that was rapidly and catastrophically pulled apart during Noah's flood, creating tsunamis and cycles of tsunamis sufficient to bury all the creatures that we have in the fossil record. For example, if you look in the middle of North America, we have a 14-state kill zone where all the dinosaurs are buried. All the dinosaurs in North America are, well, most of them, about 90% of them are right in that pocket. This is the Jurassic layers that hit it first. The Cretaceous layers are huge. It's about an 1,800-mile long by 1,000 miles wide. It's a million square miles in the middle of America that was catastrophically washed over by cycling tsunamis that were happening when the seafloor was spreading and subducting underneath the landmass, binding and kicking up tsunamis in both directions. So watch that, uh, that, that movie for more about that. But if you just look at the Morrison Formation that covers 700,000 square feet in 13 states, there's at least 141 massive bone beds in this area. We only know about 25% of the bones, 75% haven't yet been discovered. But these dinosaurs are buried with turtles, lizards, frogs, clams, and all kinds of marine life. It was a catastrophic worldwide inundation that took these creatures and buried them. And Dr. Clary from ICR has done studies on 1,800 oil core boreholes around the world. And he's even located where the dinosaurs made their last stand on America as the flood waters were rising and they were buried. There's a whole lot of trackways there along the, the yellow part. This is just a quick example of what we find in the fossil record. This is a a location in Wyoming where we see a Stegosaurus, a Camarasaurus, and an Apatosaurus buried all on top of each other. 
So how would that happen with some slow-moving river or something like this? They're sandwiched like an Oreo cake, one after the other. And that's not an atypical example. That's very, very common. These dinosaurs are typically buried under 50 to 100 feet of mud that came in during Noah's flood. And when you look at the bones, they're not, we've been conditioned to believe that fossils are rocks. They're mineralized dinosaur bones. But here's a quote from the leader, the, the leading guy of the Royal Trail Museum in, in Canada. He says, well, actually, usually most of the original bone is still present uh, in a dinosaur fossil. We've got all kinds, we have hundreds of pounds of unfossilized, unmineralized dinosaur bones uh, that we've purchased. The, the creation researchers are going great with this stuff. And secular scientists, not creation scientists, but secular scientists have now established over 14 bioorganic materials found in these dinosaur bones that show they can't be millions of years old. They can only be thousands of years old. And they're finding all kinds of stuff like this stretchy material. This is from a triceratops horn. When you demineralize the, the bone mineral, you're left with soft, squishy, pliable bone material that simply can't be 65 million years old. And there's been scientific analyses on this saying that, well, if a bone still has collagen, which it does, it can't last 65 million years old. They say collagen can only last about a million years on the maximum, yet they're finding collagen in dinosaur bones. So it's a, quite a conundrum for the evolution story. Now, just here's a quick thing that you might find kind of interesting. Numbers 19 in the Bible says God's giving a recipe to Moses, to the priestly line. And he says, take a red heifer, which is a cow, burn it to ashes, add cedar wood, add hyssop, add scarlet wool, burn them together, make a heap of ashes, and pour water through it. Does anyone know where I'm going with this? What happens when you pour water through ash? It produces something that we have in soap today. So if you take a red heifer that would burn down as tallow and lard, uh, and cedar is a very antiseptic cleansing wood, uh, the, you've got thymol inside of hyssop. People, they, they even put thymol inside of Listerine. And the wool would burn down into gritty flakes like ball, lava soap. So if you pour water through that material that I just read, you have sodium hydroxide, which is a caustic soda that was perfect for burning out bacteria. So before germs were even discovered, which were in the 1860s, Louis Pasteur discovered the germ. He's the guy that comes up with the, with the word pasteurized milk, Louis Pasteur. So we really got germs figured out in 1860, but here's the Bible 3,500 years ago with God downloading to Moses, hey, when you guys go out and touch a dead body or something unclean, I want people to wash through this water purification that would produce sodium hydroxide. So God himself downloads this amazing recipe for cleansing, and it produces something that's just like in the lye soap that you can buy today. So isn't that interesting that we have thousands of years separated, and God tells them to cover if you're diseased, quarantine, and cleanse. Those aren't, and I, I truly not, have no agenda about COVID when I bring this stuff up. I'm simply saying Bible. Uh, God says if you're diseased, he tells the leopards, hey, cover your lower jaw when you walk by people. You've got the, the quarantine thing if you were sick and cleansing. So isn't that interesting that God's telling his people to do these things because he knew about the germ, but we didn't. We didn't figure it out until 150 years ago. Uh, the God of hearing, I'm going to go really quick through a, a, a lot of this, but when I speak in secular universities, I tell them, I challenge the students, I say, look, I can prove God in one minute. And the question is simply this, how do you take the hearing system, which has five separate parts, and assemble it through random chance? It would never come together. If you look at the outer ear, it's designed for trapping sonar waves. Then three inches deep, you've got the tamponic membrane or your little eardrum that wiggles around. So as I'm pushing out the air molecules in the room today, I'm wiggling your little tamponic membrane, which is the size of a dime. And behind that, you have three little bones that are increasing that pressure by a mechanical factor 
factor of 1.7. It's actually a leverage motor that these bones are working on for your tympatic membrane. But then it gets upsampled 22 times more when those bones attach to your cochlea, which is a snail-like shell that's filled with fluid. So it gets upsampled 22 times more, turns into a chemical process that then turns into an electrical process. So as I'm pushing air molecules around the room, what you guys hear is speech and comprehend as communication happens instantly. Stuff like that does not make itself up. You can't take any one of these five components and pull it apart. The God of the universe had to put together this hearing system. It's just way too marvelous uh, as you look at it. If you look at a car, for example, a car has got an engine, transmission, wheels, a body, an electrical system. You can't take any one of those five parts out or it just wouldn't work. Uh, real quickly, the eye actually takes a much longer time to unpack. God brags in, in Proverbs and says, The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. The eye is fascinating, and it's irreducibly complex. You can't take any of these things out. And if I could zoom in on just one part of the eye that to me is amazing, it's the trampoline that you have inside your eye. Have you guys seen trampolines before that have springs all the way around the outside? Well, our lens is like the trampoline uh, skin, and it has all these molecular filaments that are connected to it so that your eye lens gets squeezed tight or relaxed, tight or relaxed, so we can focus long, short, long, short, long, short. So when you lose your dog at night and you're squinting, looking around in the dark, you're compressing that, those, those, those little areas there so you can see better because squinting helps, helps us do that. But if you just look at the eye, it is just truly amazing. Here's that trampoline with the little tiny uh, springs on it. It's just an amazing uh, design, what that looks like. You can't take those things apart, so it pulls the lens back and forth, and it's just amazing. So uh, we'll wrap up here in just a couple minutes. I know I'm going real long here tonight, but look at a leaf lopper, a, a leaf hopper. It's only two millimeters long, can spring up to nine miles an hour, and when it does that, it goes up to 400 Gs. The human body can't withstand anything close to that. It's a little tiny creature, and when it springs, it, it relies upon these little tiny gears that are in its leg sockets so that it can load up and spring. And when you look at these gears inside of its legs and you get closer and closer, here's what it looks like. Inside of that little two millimeter creature is a gear system that looks to me like it was designed. Looks incredibly designed. If you even look at a bacteria, it's got a clutch system, a little tail that spins 100,000 RPM, and it looks like a stator motor. At the molecular level, if you just look at a bacteria and zoom in really close, it's absolutely a little tiny molecular machine that God himself made. Now, I am saving the, the, the most technical thing for the end, but I want you to try to track with me here for the, the last two minutes. I know it's, know it's late. This is a complicated statistical thing I'm about to go through, but it is truly amazing, and it has to do with uh, God, God being the God of lifespans. So if you look through Genesis 5, you have records of these patriarchs before the flood living an average of 912 years. I used to just question this with my mom all the time growing up as a teenager going, come on, mom, you can't take the Bible seriously. Adam's living 930 years and Methuselah 969 years old. These guys can't live that long. But it's not just some of them. It's all of them except for Enoch. He was scouted out when he was a little bit younger. But you go through the Bible and it's not just in Genesis 5. You see Genesis 47 there where Pharaoh asks Jacob, and he says, how old are you? He says, well, my life's been easy compared to my predecessors. I'm a hundred and only 130, but he died at age 147. So when you, trap, when you map all this out, a statistical phenomenon uh, uh, emerges. So uh, by way, pick, quick background, I'm a behavioral scientist by, by training. I spent 20 years testifying as an expert in state and federal court cases, dealing with statistics and research. So I'm able to track this stuff pretty well. It's an amazing phenomenon that happens here. So you have the pre-flood patriarchs living 912 years. Eight people get on a boat, Noah's, Noah's flood about four and a half thousand years ago, and suddenly the lifespans 
exponentially and systematically decline. They don't fall off of a shelf. They start going down slowly. And Dr. Sanford has established exactly why this happens. it's, It's due to increased mutations that happen when you take the whole human gene pool and bottleneck it down to just eight people. Then the eight people get off the ark and they start spreading around the world. Their, their mutations in their genetics started exponentially increasing, causing shorter and shorter lifespans. So when you plot this out, it, there's an uncanny statistical phenomenon that pulls up, and it's called the power law curve. And biologists recognize this as what's called the biological decay curve. But the model behind this math is so strong that it has what's called an R-square of 0.95, which means 95% of the data points of the post-flood people fall within a mathematical predicted lifespan within, within a bracket. And the statistical significance is less than one chance in a quadrillion. So any scientist worth his salt would say there is a statistically significant phenomenon that's happening with the lifespans of these people. So when you plot it out, you can actually begin predicting how long people should live after the flood because this statistics, this regression has a lower prediction level and an upper prediction level. And we can see that 10 generations after Noah, people should live, the model says, between 137 and 234. And that's exactly what happens. It goes on and on. So how in the world could some, some ancient Near Eastern sheep farmer make this stuff up? Why in the world would, would Moses, 3,500 years ago, develop people a, a history and genealogies of people who systematically live shorter and shorter lives and fit it so tightly it lands on an exponentially, statistically significant power law curve? with all these formulas that would have to happen. And why would you do that anyhow? Because people would, you'd be the laughing stock of the day if people really didn't live that old. So for me, it's a phenomenal evidence that shows that we're dealing with real history here when it goes back to Genesis because you just can't make this stuff up. Jesus referred to a lot of these Old Testament characters as real historical people. And if you take Jesus' genealogy from Luke chapter 3 and trace it back over 70 generations, the Bible provides them all. It goes through the post-flood patriarchs, the pre-flood patriarchs, all the way back to Adam. So my message in showing this, you guys, is we have a a truly written Genesis account that's inspired by God, that's, that's inerrant, it's without error in its original copies, and it matches true history. And it's that history, it's that, that Genesis text that prophesied about a Savior who came and is a Savior of us all. And it's tied and anchored in real tr- history that we can trust. So when you share the Bible with your families, regard it as a true history book and increase its, uh, its credibility with your family. And I will be uh, out there at the, at the book table if anyone has more follow-up questions. Thanks.